Hi, hello, welcome to Telugu Nara Radio weekly webinar on U.S. immigration immigration system. So yeah, this is continuing every Wednesday, Central Time, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. So today we are discuss the new 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 topic. Maybe we can we can touch base the current immigration system and um, um, and uh, I want to bring the very important point here today. I ninety four status. This is a uh, very impacting the many of people. So I want to discuss very in detail about the I ninety four, and uh, we can discuss about the DACA. Maybe this is not relevant to the H one immigration, but just I want to touch base. So what is the DACA? And uh, Joe Biden is saying that um, uh, recent days he can give them. Uh, naturalization for all DACA members, we can get more information on the DACA. So every week uh, our attorney, uh, Burgos and Garrison law firm, Lucas is joining with us every week and uh, giving more information on immigration system and uh, uh, clarifying the more questions of H1 holders or immigration holders. So we can welcome to Lucas today's session. Hi, Lucas. Welcome to Telugu Nara Radio. Hi, Big Cat. Doing well. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. It's been another busy week, so uh, looking forward to the show tonight. Um, like you said, the I-94, you know, is a very important uh, topic to discuss uh, for people, everyone to be aware uh, of everything that might, you know, impact your I-94. Yes, uh, Lucas. And uh, how is the date, man? Sir? Almost we are mid of November. Still, are you applying any 485s? And uh, what is the current status about October and November? The visa status, the 485 uh, status. So yes, so currently we're still filing uh, adjustment applications, and um, you know I think we're getting close to the last of the people interested in filing, downgrading, or whatnot. Um, and so hopefully, you know, uh, uh, anyone who's had the opportunity or considered filing has done so. Uh, we've already started receiving receipts. So, uh, you know, every person should have, um, you know, three receipts respectively for the adjustment. And then, you know, hopefully about four, five weeks afterwards, uh, when you get the initial receipt, you'll get your biometrics appointment. And that's going to vary based upon the area of the country you live or where you have to go for the biometrics. So some areas have a higher population density for people who are using the um, immigration process than others. So it's all, you know, first come first serve when they schedule appointments. Um, uh, the visa bulletin probably is gonna be much like last month. It's gonna come out towards the end of the month, uh, last week. And, um, you know, I've really don't expect any major movement on EB2 or EB3, uh, and, but I do believe that USCIS is probably gonna uh, go back to the final action date for the policy of accepting cases. So it's really important if there is any thought about filing, that your case is filed before the end of the month, then obviously if you use an attorney, don't forget uh, next week we have a holiday, so it is gonna limit the amount of uh, uh, working days that we have. Okay, so is confirmed and not December visa bulletin going to the final action date, or no? It's not confirmed yet, but it's one can speculate or guess, you know, based upon the number of applications that have been filed, and uh, you know what what the progress is. You know, yeah, I, I can only estimate maybe twenty twenty five thousand have filed on top of the normal workload. So we uh, don't really know uh, what the capacity is for that at the moment, but I'm sure it'll uh, USCIS will use the final action date, uh, you know, so they can probably catch up with their processing. Yeah, most of the whoever the maybe nearby, maybe before 2012, 2012 January, most of them they are waiting for the next visa bulletin, and uh, at the same time they are expecting from the USCIS. They, it, it could be allow, allow uh, 
applying and uh, filing application filing date. So hopefully the next month also will continue to on filing date section. So uh, we'll see how it goes to the uh, on visa bulletin. So Lucas, it means so what is the status on um, the wages level where we are? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, there's been, you know, some significant movement the past uh, week in the sense that we had four cases that were filed um, against uh, the government, Department of Labor, uh, um, for the, the rule change for a violation of the uh, Administrative Procedures Act. And um, the judge in, in the main case has consolidated all the other cases uh, into one matter. And the, both sides, both the plaintiffs and the defendant, the government, has uh, already submitted their uh, response briefs. And um, I believe there's a hearing set for the 24th, which I, I think is next, uh, is it next Tuesday? Um, Anyways, I, I believe it's the 24th, and uh, hopefully thereafter we'll have some news uh, one way or the other about that. So we, you know, I was hoping this week or late last week that we would have better news. But, you know, I, I think it's uh, trending in a good direction whenever all the cases are consolidated. Um, means that all the points are similar. Uh, all the arguments are similar. Instead of having multiple courts, maybe having different opinions or different you know, maybe you have out of four courts, maybe one court decides one way and three the other way. So you want to have everything concise whenever you have the same issue discussed, you know. Um, now, the judge that's overseeing the case is in Washington, D.C. And this is the same judge who's handled a few high profile matters. Most recently, I believe he was the judge presiding over Michael Flynn's uh, trial, which was the um, presidential, the uh, advisor to the president uh, for some time, uh, a short period of time after the president uh, took office in 2016, I believe. Okay. So, Lucas, uh, uh, maybe the H1 wages uh, is in um, court. The Whoever want to apply the extension between this, uh, maybe from October 8th to till date or maybe future until the court decide. So mm -hmm. you already uh, said a lot of times, many times, um, we can use the uh, both OF, OFC data, wages data, and also alternate wages, wages data. Correct. So just here, I want to understand, maybe everyone understand, let's say if you take the two different, um, the wages uh, agencies, we can, we can talk about the wage agencies, the OFC and uh, alternative. If say, if take any um, county, maybe zip code, uh, the software developer, let's say the OFC is uh, earlier before is uh, maybe 94 or 96. Now it is uh, comes around 122, 127. If compared to the alternative, alternative wages system, the, which, uh, how much we, um, the wage for the alternate, if you if you do the alternate, it near to the 94 or maybe in between um, 94 or 122. How much difference you see the maybe compared to the both two agencies, wages, wage, uh, wages agencies? It, it really depends on the area. So what you have to remember, what the purpose of the prevailing wage and the reason why we use it is we want to know uh, within... Uh, you know, statistical data, what the, the, the rate would be. So of the things that are factored in are going to be the mean uh, wage rate, uh, the median. So you have the overall average, then you have that the most common, the median, which would be the most common within that range. And then you would also have uh, cost of living factors, right? So if you're in Santa Clara or the Bay Area, the cost of living is is much greater than if you're in Houston or Dallas, where we are, and um, that that impacts that. So, alternative wage uh, surveys also incorporate, you know, this data. So, some of the, the, the you know, there's 
multiple different wages uh, or uh, surveys that you can take for these wages. Uh, the best practice would be, you know, what USCIS is going to examine and Department of Labor is going to examine is, uh, you know, what is the background of the wage survey? You know, what was the, the data behind the published uh, rates? So you have to kind of show that it's not just, uh, you know, a token survey or something like this. It, the, it really has significant data points in it. So to answer your question, uh, uh, basically, the, the the published rates are going to pretty much m mirror within five to seven percent, probably most of the time. Uh, what's going to be on uh, the surveyed wage, and, and a lot of this is also impacted on the professions that are used. So, uh, usually, like you know, medical professions um, uh, would be one where you'd want to use maybe an alternative wage survey. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the wages can be significantly lower than what a, the OES would, would publish. But, um, you know, uh, again, the main benefit using OES is that you're relying on the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, BLS system, and, and they're going to have their own data that is accepted by USCIS and Department of Labor. So there's less challenge uh, on that. So it makes it smoother, more efficient. Uh, it's from a practitioner standpoint and just to tie in your first comment it, um, it's very important you know uh, when, when we're discussing i-94s uh, when issues like this arise you know typically my practice what we do is we always encourage uh, any extension that needs to be filed to be filed six months prior to the expiration of your i-94 okay a lot of yes and lucas um, maybe i'm um, uh, maybe I'm sorry to stopping you. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Just, just uh, I want to ask the question on the I-94. I want to give the, some more details on the, uh, for the H-1 holders, main um, H-1 holders and L-1 holders. So the scenario is, let's say we can understand, if any applicant, H-1 applicant, the first apply for the position, maybe any company is the sponsoring the H-1, so they apply to the USCIS. If everything is good, the USCIS will approve the I-797, maybe I-129. Mm -hmm. So once the I-129 approved, maybe if it is a counselor process, we need to go to the consulate and get a stamp. Once the stamp, uh, stamp uh, United States, if you enter to the United States, the port of entry officer give the I-94. So here, here um, the it means that here's the three different areas to understand everyone. Let's say is uh, I-129 is only the petition to get uh, allowed to work in United States. The first uh, first stage. The if you go to the consulate, if you have the approved I-129 or maybe I-797, then you can get the the stamping on visa or pass, stamping on, stamp, you get the visa. The once you, you have the visa, then you can able to travel to the United States. Then only, this is a, um, the process to get entered to the United States in anything, irrespective of H1, maybe L1 or B, L1 or, maybe B1 is a, a different approach, but uh, the main, I want to focus on H1 and L1. So, uh, the while enter, entering to the United States, the uh, border and security force will give the I-94. That is a very important to the United States to stay in United States. So if you if you do not have the proper I-94, definitely it will impact your status and uh, uh, it will uh, potentially trigger issues in future travel or maybe future application in the United States immigration system. Mm -hmm. So first, just to, if you want to add any point on this one, maybe um, am I correct or is any additional point you want to add in this area? We can discuss yeah. another point. So basically, you're correct with what you said. You know, it's real important. And what gives you the work authorization on an H or L visa would be your I-94. So 
you need to show your employer uh, when they are uh, completing the I-9 form or employment verification that you're going to have to show them your passport and your I-94. Now, the I-94 can appear in two places. You can have as a port of entry, like what you discussed is one way. If you came in with uh, an H-1B stamp, that's what you would use. Um, Now, some people come here as students uh, under F-1 and they change their status. uh, And at that point, you would show your approval notice with your passport. So the I-94 is going to be assigned to you and the number will not change until you depart and re-enter the United States. So it's very important that even if you're doing an extension of status, that you have the correct I-94 <laughs> associated with your case, which, you know, um, most of the time, that's not an issue. Some people uh, you might overlook it or have, you know, not the most current um, I-94. It's pretty easy to check uh, your current I-94. You can go to the Customs and Border Patrol website, uh, just enter your name, date of birth, country where you're from, and your passport number, and it's very easy to pull up your most current I-94. Yes, here events I saw a lot of issues. Maybe most of the the immigration holders got affected because of uh, uh, even uh, I saw the certain scenarios. Let's say if I went to the out of United States and come back, uh, I-94. Maybe my observation it depending on to document. The one is uh, the visa, I-797 uh, approver, and also and also passport expiration date, mm-hmm. right? So I observed uh, the some of the officers are giving the I-94 based on the I-797 approval, the tenure. The some of the officers are giving the based on the uh, passport to expiration date. So in this scenario, most of the most of the H1 holders, um, it means they, it means they did not think about the this thin line process within the immigration system. Even right. they they did not think, hey, I have the I-797 for next two, three years. Um, it means they feel that they had the uh, uh, they they had the valid U.S. status document. So That's they. Very- they they, they forgot between this thin line process, this is causing lots of lots of people in within the United States immigration holders. Yeah, so, so here my question is why the officers are giving the two different um, uh, I-94, maybe. It, it means either everyone should follow the same, the same document, either passport expiration or I-797 tenure. Yeah, it, it it's a really a straightforward answer, uh, and I know it gets confusing because someone will have an I seven nine seven A, and it will say my visa, my status is extended till December of two thousand twenty three, uh, and then you'll go travel, you'll go home, you'll come back, and maybe in your scenario, you're you're only granted uh, your new I ninety four until two thousand twenty one, uh, June or something like that. Um, and so what happens, what, what is the most correct or what is the correct I-94 that you reference? Well, it's going to be the most recent I-94 that you received or from your last entry. So the 2021 date is uh, key at that point. Now, do you need to depart and come back in with a new passport? Can you just file for an extension of status when you're here? Uh, the answer to both of those would be yes. Um, and most common before the pandemic, what would happen is, you know, you could get your new passport as long as your stamp was still valid in your old passport, for, you know, you can still use that to enter uh, the country and then you can depart and re-enter the country, get a, the updated I-94 that uh, will reference the full three-year period that was on the approval notice. Uh, most common uh situation that happens is people overlook this and you know they'll they'll be here in the states and they'll overstay their visa and uh you know if you can imagine now during the pandemic where traveling is very difficult um with lockdowns and other things it makes it even more of an issue uh you know to get that rectified now there's certain tools we have um you know we can file you know a knock pro tonk 
uh, action, which basically is saying, you know, I'm going to fix this error because the the beneficiary or the applicant, the depending if it's an H4, H1 visa holder, uh, made an error that it wasn't their from it wasn't their fault. Uh, they're not in removal proceedings and other and they've otherwise in the I-94 expiring, they've maintained their their status, right? So there's yeah. ways of fixing it. But uh, yeah, you know, most common with this, we see that with H1 and H4. I can't tell you how many H4s uh, have come across like this where people forget or don't realize because they only focus on you know the principal H1B holders validity period. And uh, they forget to check, especially with kids, because kids' passports, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think they're only good for maybe three years at a time. Maybe five years, for Indians, five years. Five years. And yeah. so sometimes, uh, you know, you, you'll have a young child and their I-94 is not going to match yours because maybe their passport expires much sooner. So, yeah, it's very important. I'm glad you brought up this point. And, and you know, it's very easy to pull the most recent I-94. Um, just go to your Customs and Border Patrol website, enter the I-94 data, and uh, it's very easy to populate the fields and get that I-94 number. Yeah. So just I brought this one. Um, I it meant so everyone should understanding the what is a thin line process and uh, uh, everyone should understanding the what is the importance of the each uh, maybe uh, approval notice. It means approval notice is I-797, maybe mm -hmm. the the stamping on your passport and I-94. These are the three different uh, thing, but uh, this is a very important role is interdependence between the uh, documents. If you want to stay with, uh, if you want to come to the United States, uh, these documents are interrelated, interdependency. So it means uh, recently I hear one of the scenario on I-94 expiration, uh, one scenario is um, the one H1 holder is uh, extended for next uh, is current uh, the h1 is expiring so their com his company is uh, extended mm -hmm. so what he did is he did not inform to the their employer he left to the left he left to india maybe the current uh, h1 uh, visa valid next couple of months only two months or three months so he did not, uh, maybe he thought that he, he extended the H1. So he did not inform to the their employer. He left to the India, he come back. So between in this um, travel, I-94 I got changed. So he ignored actually. Later H1 got approved, but he did not uh, realize and he did not um, uh, check the I-94, latest I-94, he ignored. So, it means uh, he got only the one year of uh, approval, H1 approval extension. So then he he started to the next extension. He he checking to the maybe internal uh, HR department, the att attorneys. They said that um, your I-94 is not matching. Mm. So here the scenario is almost uh, eight months uh, completed by the time. So is the two things actually. As for our understanding, uh, within 90 days, maybe we can do something. But uh, after 180 days, maybe USCS uh, straight away 10 hours, 10, 10 years bar or something on any application process or something. Like, can you give the more information? This scenario, maybe um, what is what is the first thing is we need to check the I-94 frequent, not frequently when you travel, just you need to check and the latest I-94. So if anyone maybe missed or ignored or something happened, what are the action points? Maybe what are the action points they want to check and they want to take the action point? Can you give some suggestions or maybe sure. steps? Sure, so just as any system, if you can imagine how many people enter and depart the United States on a daily basis, uh, if you are, you, even using uh, Six Sigma terminology, right, which would be 99.999% accurate, there's still that, that small factor that's not going to be uh, correct. So you're accounting for almost perfect, but it's nothing's ever perfect. I've even had 
uh, a case recently where um, for an H-4 visa holder where it, it shows that the person departed the United States, but when in fact they never left. So these mistakes can happen. Best practice is I always recommend people to travel with the original documents. So what, what we mean is you have your consular pack with you and with your consular pack, you're going to have your original approval notice, your passport. And after you come back in and you go through immigration, when you get home, keep print out the I-94 and make sure it matches what was stamped in your passport. And then just keep that with your record. It's, if you have something like that, a process where you have your documents together and you're able to verify, you can catch the mistake early. Now, what if you don't catch the mistake? Well, there's certain things that attorneys can argue and we can usually rectify you know, later on. Uh, but the main issue, of course, besides you know any type of bar that would be there would be, let's say uh, you come back and, and you miss this point and it's been um, eight or nine months and you're now, like what we've been talking about for the past month, you know, all these dates move and now you're able to get your GC. Well, if there's a, over a six month, uh, anything over six months, uh, you don't qualify for a waiver for any unlawful presence. So you wouldn't be able to even adjust your status at that point. So it can be a, a simple process can lead to, to huge headache down the road. Um, and, you know, whenever our office are part of our workflow, we always uh, pull the fresh I-94 for every case. Um, we never rely on what people give us because people often omit or forget uh, even to renew their passports. We remind people, you know, every now and then to do that. Um, so it just, you know, ch check, double check. It's always best practice. And then always make sure, you know, whenever you come in the port of entry that, you know, within the same day or the next day, pull the I-94 for your records and uh, just make sure everything matches. So in this scenario, if, if you want to come back to the United States, is there is no option for the next 10 years or is there any option to? Like I said, there's a tool that we can use. It's a terminology, it's a Latin term called uh, nunc pro tunc. And basically, in essence, what it what the process entitles is, is it's like if you had a time machine, you're going back to fix something as if you were there. So we can fix and, you know, it, 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 nothing is perfect, nothing is automatic, but, uh, you know, majority of the time we're able to use this tool to rectify any problem that was overlooked. Now, I always tell people, you want to have your own future, your own uh, uh, well-being in your hands. Don't, don't rely on an officer or someone else or your employer to take care of you, you know, because at the end of the day, you're responsible for yourself. And, you know, some people overlook things and, and by focusing on other issues that come up or life events, you know, things get um, overlooked. And it, it's always best at the end of the day, just make sure that I-94 is uh, taken care of. You want to always guard that um, because that's what you need uh, to maintain while you're here, at least until you can adjust your status and move on to the, you know, cis, the pathway of citizenship. Yeah, 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 got you. Just to even so some of the H1 holders, just so that is an overlook or maybe the misunderstanding the process. And uh, some of, uh, they don't have the, the more information about this uh, I-94. Everyone thought is, I have the I-797 approved for the next 10 years. It means, I, it means they thought it generally, I have a valid uh, work authorization. It means they don't think about the status, I-94 status. So here, one question, um, Lucas, we are discussing I-94. Let's say uh, I, I travel to India, I come back in Port of Entry, they give an uh, fortune, unfortunate, next I-94 for next 10 years. Let's say next 10 years. It means I have the valid I-94 uh, for next 10 years. So within the United States, it means it's illegal to stay in within United States, right? For next 10 years. Uh, well, I don't, typically, you know, for H-1B, you can't get an I-94 <coughs> more than three years because it's a, okay. 
just uh, it was, yeah i understand but just um, i would like to check one scenario here it means i saw the the couple of people get five years or five years of i94 so even though their i7 and 7 is uh, three years they get they get the five years so that is a very rare rare rare, rare scenario i am not saying every time but a very rare scenario just i want to understanding the uh, i7 and 7 approved uh, um, approved and i94 the validity of i94 so if i have the i94 for the next 5 years it, it means uh, i have a valid uh, status for the next 5 years or it should be aligned with the i797 approved copy well so what you would be referring to would be if an officer at the port of entry made a mistake uh, which happens you know it's it's not uncommon i've i've seen it before where you know someone will be admitted uh to the united states in a certain status maybe for a certain duration of time that doesn't match what it should be and USCIS can go and fix this uh, if they notice the error and they you know can do a notion a motion or a notice of intent to revoke um, or deny and uh, you know at that point in time it you know that that's when that issue comes up but as far as five years I mean you have to remember when you're traveling and you go through the port of entry off you know part of what the officer is going to want to see is your I797A approval notice correct yes so typically if they reference that for the dates and they record a different date um, at some point in the future USCIS USCIS will find that and adjust that so it won't go uh, unchecked but yeah it, again if something like that does happen it's best to notify your attorney or someone else or even the office the officer at the port of entry say look these states don't match um, and they, they can fix that at that point in time okay the look here i want to discuss one one more scenario let's say um my h1 is going to be uh, expire next six months so mm -hmm. i started to i started to extend extension so uh, the total one one month period events uh, i filed the uh, i I-797 I in premium process, I got the approved I-7, my extension got approved uh, within mm -hmm. one month. Maybe I have the next five months in existing, um, the old I-797. So if I, if I, if I, let's say I went to India. So at the same time, I, I went to the consolation process to get the stamp on my passport. I had done the, the, that part too. So once come back to the United States in port of entry, this is a very thin line process. Um, we, even so we need to carry the both the old I-797 and the new uh, future I-797, both document or which document we need to show to the port of well, entry officer. So when you go for stamping, you're gonna have to have the original anyway. Right. Yeah. So the most recent yeah. original I-797. So you'd want to show that to the officer. And obviously, you know, the officer can pull up that information as, as well on the visa stamp. So the visa stamp itself will reference the most recent approval. And they'll then. So, I mean, not like I said, nothing is perfect. There's always even within the world of Six Sigma, which is what most manufacturing and, and other uh uh, businesses strive for you know you're you're acknowledging that that nothing is perfect and there's still going to be a minute a minute uh, error you know every now and then so these things happen and, and there's tools in place to fix these but most importantly you know if, if if you can notice and fix a problem at the beginning it's much better than waiting and not knowing about it until you know it comes up in, in a year or a year and a half because that's that's when the real headache kind of would start or uh, it'd be a bigger mess to, to fix. And like I said, most of the time we see this is with um, young children where their I-94s don't match the parents or maybe uh, wife travels and she doesn't have an updated um, uh, approval notice matching husband and you don't realize this and, and uh, or maybe husband gets, you know, an extension after wife returns, but she didn't get do an extension at that time or travel plans on traveling and doesn't travel. There's all sorts of 
scenarios that have come up and uh, that we've helped solve and address. But uh, it, it is more frequent than what we would like to see. But uh, yeah. at the end of the day, it, it's not major to overcome this, but you shouldn't want to have to pay an attorney or have a headache if you can avoid it. For all those, um, the issues are the only one solution is just we want to keep verify the latest I-94 when travel to any other countries or maybe uh, you come back, to, you come back to the United States. That is the only one solution to um, it means aware the about the I-94 and uh, proactively in future, let's say they have the maybe six months or 10 months proactively they can take a process to extend the I-94 status. Correct. That, and that's what we like to see. I try and, you know, for all the companies that, that we help manage all their um, H1s, you know, we try and have certain uh, tools that we have in software and things like this to help uh, catch these things. But like I said, you know, no system is, is perfect. Um, and, and every now and then things come up. But like I said, at the end of it, it at the end of the day, you want to be responsible for yourself. You don't want to leave your life or your job or your status in someone else's hands, right? So it's it's always best to be inquisitive, double check everything, uh, and then you know make sure you keep everything in your records. Yeah, yeah, that is on I ninety four. It means I saw a lot of issues uh, and my friends and uh, friends mm -hmm. and friends. Just I want to bring and discuss. Uh, in the very detail so that everyone get to understanding the the H1 process or L1 process. So they might be aware and get more information and uh, uh, be in a uh, valid status and within within United States. So that is uh, my base idea to bring this I-94. I think that I think that that's a very valid thought and, and just to give you an, another <laughs> thought about this, you know, what if you have EAD and your adjustments pending? You know, most people forget to, to look at this or monitor to make sure their I-94 is still valid. So what you're doing and what the topic that you brought up is very valid and it encompasses not just H1 or L1 status, but also if you're trying to go ahead and get your GC, um, because you do, in case something happens to your uh, <laughs> Uh, adjustment status application, you know, if it gets denied or something happens, um, you, you you still need to have your non-immigrant visa to, to stay here and, 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 you know, to have ability to work. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a very uh, valid information on I-94. Uh, Lucas, uh, the next January 20, Biden is taking over. So I think uh, Biden administration is trying to take a transition from the Trump, right? So do you have any information about the transition uh, on immigration or USCIS or DOL? Do you have any information from the ILA or maybe? We have we have uh, quite a few talking points and, and policy suggestions that, that obviously we would like to see advanced. Uh, I know that from speaking with uh, well, or even watching the news that, that Trump has pretty much blocked the new administration from any transition. And, you know, again, today there is a practice where um, they're trying to implement and permanently change the system uh, in the sense that they're, you know, before they leave, they want to do as much as they can to fit their agenda. So uh, here recently um, for DACA, you brought up in the beginning, uh, you know, the a court ordered, um, you know, USCIS and, and the acting director uh, to go ahead and, and again process new uh, DACA applications and give extensions and, and so, so on and so forth. And uh, basically the decision was made because as an acting director, you're not really fully confirmed by the Senate. Uh, therefore, a policy that goes on this way is not valid because you're not recognized as being able to make those policy changes. And uh, so now it, this administration, you know, it, it's late in the game are trying to use uh, uh, 
the FEMA director, which was confirmed by Congress, to go ahead and implement some of these policies. So there, I can say to sum it up, uh, Trump's not making it easy. Hopefully January 20th comes and passes without any major challenges or any major pro uh, problems. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of major issues that are pending at the moment from immigration court backlogs to obviously visa backlogs for EB2, EB3 uh, uh, people from India. Uh, people at the border are detained. And kids are separated from parents. Uh, the DACA issue where kids are, you know, that once qualified for the program now cannot qualify. So there's a lot of things that need to be fixed. And um, it, uh, hopefully we can, it can be addressed quickly, but sometimes these resolutions or, or solutions to current problems might take some time uh, to achieve. So touch wood, you know, hopefully everything goes well. I hope, everyone hope. Um, so it will uh, get uh, maybe biden administration will uh, do something on the immigration system mm -hmm. so uh, lucas it means generally uh, the, when the it means any presidential change when generally when the the transition start after take take the oath or maybe before is a is a the before take the oath well yeah, that's a good point. So typically in the past, uh, the sitting president or the sitting administration, including the cabinet and other high ranking officials, will meet and start, you know, briefing the new administration and the, the points of contact that are the proposed cabinet members or whatnot, you know, to get them up to speed with the current <clears throat> processes, maybe uh, sensitive information is shared. Um, and then also what's involved, especially since we're speaking of immigration, you would incorporate, you know, the non, um, uh, the, the non-political uh, uh, positions. You have se senior uh, officials within the agencies that, you know, that's just their job. They've been doing this uh, through different presidents, different administrations, and they would be involved. So they have their own, you know, hey, you know, this is your policy with the big picture and you want to do A, B, and C, well, to do that, it's going to, you know, require us to do all these things. This is feasible. This approach might not be feasible. And, and so it's a short period of time that the two um, administrations have to maybe coordinate with each other. So it's like a month and a half, maybe two months maximum uh, that one would have. So, you know, by de delaying this or stalling that from even happening is really hindering the new administration when they take office on the 20th. Okay. I think uh, the current uh, USCA chief is Stephen Miller, right, Lucas? No, so S Stephen Miller is uh, the architect behind a lot of these. He's a senior advisor to the president, um, and he comes from other certain groups that are anti-immigrant, uh, in their nature. So there's certain what we call uh, political action committees and things like this where people donate money, invest a lot of money uh, to basically say we don't like I immigration. And uh, he, he comes from that world and he, he's, uh, he sets forth, I guess, recommendations to the president on how to administer the policy that, that they want to achieve. So he, he's uh, just an advisor, but most all these problems, especially with H1s, L1s, uh, stem from him, yes. Okay. So, uh, Lucas, um, just so we cannot going to discuss about the, the proposed rule for the H1, right? Still in a common period, right? So, do you think uh, we'll go implement it or still do you have any information so, on the phone? Uh, see, so this is part of what we're talking about when the Trump is trying to to issue rules. If it was a president, if it was a, some type of proclamation or something from the president, the new president could easily just change the policy, okay, and implement their own rule. Um, when they go through the rulemaking process like this, it's much more difficult to change. So the comment period on this new rule closes on the second of December, and the thirty days beyond that would still be before you know, the new administration would take over. So there's a chance 
pretty good chance probably that the rule will be in effect. Now, having said that, there's still ways to challenge this, you know, um, and probably the easiest, most straightforward way to fix anything would be passing new legislation uh, from Congress. Uh, so it's very important, uh, you know, this this um, runoff election in Georgia with these two additional senators, it's very important that, you know, how the outcome of that transpires, because that uh, would mean a lot if, you know, if the Democrats have the House and the Senate and the president's uh, office, uh, it makes it easier to pass, you know, any any fixes to this. Now, if the Republicans still have the Senate, it makes it much more difficult for us to maybe fix some of the, the things Trump has implemented, especially in regards to the H-1B uh, process. Yeah. I think uh, this new rule proposal, this is the third party approval or one year extension. What what is what are the this new so rules? The one is a, one is a, to, yeah, they're trying to fix the to to put in the rule the the what we call the Newfeld memo in regards to employer employee relationship. Uh so in the past it was just a memo and uh you know, with USCIS this past year in the IT Serve Alliance lawsuit, withdrew those the memo for that and the third party offsite employment uh, as part of an, a settlement agreement to the lawsuit. Now, instead of re implementing a, a new memo, which they agreed not to, they're going through the rulemaking process. So, if, if anyone's familiar or remembers, you know, just a few months ago, we had to have all the contracts, client letters, work product, you know, instead of a traditional uh petition being this thick you know they're getting thicker and thicker with all the work and product and um contracts and everything involved uh so that's going to be there and then obviously limiting um the one year duration now the you know the, this opens up more for lawsuits to where this situation this issue could be settled obviously uh congress authorized up to three years for the visa so automatically limiting that three years to just one year might allow a, a lawsuit to be successful on on that challenge. But again, you know, if this goes, in, it's going to take months for that to be litigated uh, and, and changed. Um, even if we have Biden as president, there's still, you know, processes and procedures that have to be followed to get any kind of substantial change uh, that might come about in regards to this new rule. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. The Lucas, just I want to touch base about the Dhaka events. Uh, most of the, the most of the maybe immigration the holders, even I, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I don't know the whole Dhaka situation. So, can you give the brief information? It means so Dhaka is a deferred action child would arrival. So I think it it's it started from the uh, Obama brought the new process in 2012, mm -hmm. right? So the overall statistics is uh, almost um, the DACA dreamers, they called as a dreamers, uh, around uh, 800,000 or maybe 800 to 1 million, between uh, 1 million. So can you give me the uh, inform information? Uh, how many years of lag of this dreamers are DCA um, DACA? Is piling up to the 800,000. So it compared to the immigration system, maybe H1 holders are maybe around 300 to 600,000. The immigrant to get the naturalization or naturalization well, or something. So I think I think you brought up some very important points. And just to go back, I want to explain uh, what DACA is. So you're correct. DACA is an acronym that means Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Now. The first part of this acronym, deferred action, what does this mean? Deferred action means you're, it, it's something that is granted where it's not giving you legal status, it's not giving you a non-immigrant visa, it's not again, giving you a green card. It, all it's saying is we're not going to remove you from the country uh, at this moment, right? So it, it's not a good status to be in, but it does it does allow you to have employment authorization and uh, allow you to be, you know, be here without a fear of being put through removal proceedings or, you know, 
you it allows you also to get like you know in states driver's license some sort of identity so you can continue going to school if you want to pursue college uh so it, it's a small small um piece of the pie i guess you could say if, as far as comparing to h1 as far as like if you want to have lawful status here so uh the dreamers what what the eventually what we we're talking about are, are children who are brought here as a young age uh and no america is if they were born here but technically are not u.s citizens and when they came here either they came without permission uh or if they had any type of visa, it long expired. And, uh, you know, so there's certain conditions to, to have this um, deferred action, one of which, you know, you have to be going to school or have graduated from school, like high school. Uh, you cannot have any significant misdemeanor, uh, you know, so th there's a, a significant misdemeanor might mean like a, a drunk driving charge or something like that. Um, and you know there's certain other factors involved with that but you know it, it's not a status as or it's not a status but it's it's something it, you don't want to be in that in that category i guess i could say uh, so we need to have a plan of action instead of just saying pause just like it would be similar to like the h1 holder who's waiting for 20 years to get gc you know we also don't want kids to be here starting a family trying to get a career and they there's really there's no path there's no future for them so these are things we want to address and it has to be done in a correct way a responsible way but something does need to happen because it's it's not fair or equitable uh for someone to just kind of be you know uh in, in limbo so to speak so it's just the same we we feel that way as immigration attorneys we feel passionate about dreamers just as passionate as I feel about H1V, H1B visa holders who, you know, are stuck in a backlog. You know, you don't want to ever uh, stay in a certain, you know, limbo for a long period of time. If, you, if your goal is to come here and have a green card and, and you choose you want to become a citizen or something, you know, we should make that more available, uh, not restrictive, because uh, our country is made from immigrants, by immigrants, right? Yeah. So why admits I brought this one and Biden is uh, in political agenda. He said that he can give the 1 million the green cards. So just uh, is there any differentiate between the immigration H1 uh, immigration and uh, DACA? I think uh, mo most of the the undocumented in DACA, maybe around uh, the 1 million or 10 million people are in United States. Do you have any rough information on that? I think it's so when you're talking about a certain category of certain age, it's probably um, more close to the 1 million. Um, but then, you know, what do we call people who are in that category? I mean, are we, there's certain age ranges, like you, for DACA, you had to be here before you were 16. Uh, you had to be b born between certain time frames. Yep. So there, there are certain, okay. you know, uh, factors where they get that number. But yeah, there's, there's quite a few undocumented people um, here in the states that hopefully we can get some type of pathway or help them out okay so yeah hopefully the h1 or l1 holders uh, may be seeking the more information about the the biden administration the future proposal to get the green card green card uh, so hopefully by next uh, maybe march or april we get we get uh, some more information to biden maybe really will implement or not i mean it will take some time but uh, we need to wait we need to be be patient so then uh, well i think what you have to remember is everyone in, in this go through the immigration process it's just as important as other people but there's multiple different categories um and i think there's been pretty good push uh from Aila especially to, to say, hey, we need to address each category equally. Uh, we can't just say, hey, there's a humanitarian crisis at the border. Let's forget every other immigrant group uh, that needs attention. So I think part of the plan is, and Congress could do this tomorrow if they wanted to, uh, they could issue 
you know, say, hey, well, there's a backlog here for fiscal year 2021 or 2022. We're going to issue this many additional visas for people who are employment based and from these countries. Or if you, they could say, if your I-140 has been approved and, uh, and pending for more than six months, then the visa is automatically available. They could legislate anything. And then uh, the president can sign it into law, and then that's one fix right there. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can happen. And um, part of the process, you know, is convincing all the, the members of Congress and the, the Senate to uh, have the majority vote so it can become law. So, th- th- you know, we might start with one idea, and that idea can change and progress and, and become something different you know, due to uh, bipartisan work uh, or maybe listening to everyone's point of view, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, Lucas, uh, already the seven, maybe two minutes uh, than 7 p.m. So we discussed a lot of things on um, the current immigration system and uh, majorly I-94. So do you have any uh, information you want to share apart from this today? I think, uh, you know, like I said, uh, well, like we say every week, follow and like our Facebook page, uh, BGM Law and Telugu NRA Radio. And we'll update as things happen. This has been, you know, an unprecedented time of change. And, you know, just as we discussed today and Benkat brought up about, you know, the I-94 issue and being diligent and paying attention to these uh, issues is also important to pay attention to the news and what's happening um, because right now uh, things are changing on a daily basis and uh, you know we want to all stay uh, up to date and keep the community informed uh, what these changes are and how they might impact you so yeah. in, in anything that you know anyone ever ha- has a question or a concern that's what we're here for yeah thank you so yeah viewers and listeners so we discussed a lot of um, important uh, topic here today. Uh, maybe we are requesting everyone to maintain I-94 uh, active because we saw a lot of issues and uh, they went back to the their own countries due to the unlawful presence in uh, United States due to the non-maintenance of I-94. Just uh, Check your I-90, latest I-94 once you step into the United States and uh, make um, act to I-94 and don't fall into the major issues. It potentially impacted your, if you want to seek into the green card or citizenship in United States, these kind of um, issues potentially impact your green card and uh, citizenship. So uh, Lucas is saying that just uh, one step is just uh, check your latest I-94 one step into the United States. So that is the only one solution to keep active I-94. So only one thing, that is only only one thing. So yeah, anyway, it means we discuss um, every, it means um, we continue to this show every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time. We can, we, we will discuss the more topics on immigration systems. Maybe you can post or maybe you can connect to the Telugu NRA Radio Facebook or you can call to the um, bridge call and uh, you can directly talk to the Lucas and get uh, more information on your scenario, maybe questions, any topic. So we are ready to help to you. So please tune to the Telugu NRA Radio. And uh, if if you have any questions or if you have any questions or topic, maybe you can send to Lucas, uh, info at bgimmlaw.com. The Lucas is uh, very active. He ready to, even you can see instant replay. So, and try it means connect to Lucas and get more information and uh, keep safe, keep keep happy. Uh, and one more thing, uh, Lucas, I think uh, the Corona pandemic is started the second wave. Keep safe and uh, uh, avoid the gathering. You too. Where you where too. where, where, where the wear the mask and uh, protect your family and protect you and protect your family and protect community. So uh, today, today, yeah, today is the end of the event. We are closing the show. Um, we can connect to next week. See you on Wednesday. 
Thanks, Lucas. Thank you very much for being with Telugu and Ara Radio. Thank you, Venkat. Yeah, signing off from Venkat Houston, Lucas from Dallas.